is a dark age. It is a bloody age. It is an age of the world's ending. The Empire stands as a bulwark against the dark. And as the world ends, the Empire will need heroes like never before. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am Knight General Lutz, and today I'm going to tell you tales of arcane lore. Today, I'm going to be talking about the great novels of the Warhammer Fantasy series. Warhammer Fantasy started life as a tabletop war game called Warhammer Fantasy Battle and was released in 1983, 41 goddamn years ago. Like the later 40k, you would get rule books, and these rule books would tell you how to play the game and would be filled with arcane lore. In addition, you would also collect models, and then finally, once you knew the rules and had all the points, you would fight them. The style of Warhammer Fantasy Battle was different from the later 40k. In short, the battles were larger and more elaborate with it being large armies doing battle instead of the small squads like in 40k. In Warhammer Fantasy, you would buy blocks of units instead of just one guy. Honestly, it sounded pretty epic and I kinda wanna play it. Warhammer Fantasy would also get a pen and paper RPG called Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And according to 1D6chan, the mainline war game would kind of combine RPG elements with the tabletop combat. And that sounds even more epic. 40k would come along in 1988 and both Fantasy and 40k would coexist until 2014. <sighs> when sadly, flagging model sales for Fantasy would see it rebooted into the much more 40k-esque Age of Sigmar. Warhammer Fantasy takes place on the unnamed Warhammer world, and at one time it was said that this world existed in the Warhammer 40k Milky Way galaxy, but that would later get retconned. 40k is the sci-fi spin-off of Warhammer Fantasy, meaning that much of what we would later see in Warhammer 40k got its start in Fantasy. 40k can best be described as a much more extreme and dark version of Warhammer Fantasy, and while they both share Warhammer in the title, the two settings could not be more different from one another. First, Warhammer Fantasy takes place on one planet, and you got all the same villains from 40k and a couple new ones. You got the orcs, but unlike in 40k, they have a C instead of a K. You got Koas, Dark Eldar, the works. And on the good guy side, you actually have legitimate good guys, and not just people that are good by comparison. You got the humans, dwarfs, and elves, along with a few others. But everything in fantasy is a bit more logical and altogether better thought out. With 1D6 Chan saying that Warhammer Fantasy was a setting by history nerds for history nerds, actually, and this is remarkably true. And Warhammer Fantasy is based upon real world history, just with more Cthulhu monsters and zombies. The best part about Warhammer Fantasy is that it's a fantasy setting that is not hard to get into, as the books primarily focus upon character and how they deal with the current plot problems, and while the novels have lore dumps, they don't devote countless pages to lore. You're not going to have cool character moments and then an entire chapter of just backstory. It gives you enough to keep you invested, but not enough to put you to sleep. And while this is a fantasy book series, the writing is down to earth and focuses on real people. And the best part, the writers start and finish their works instead of being like Mr. Martin and being a tease. Now 40k, that's a dark universe. Could it be grim dark? Yeah, it depends. In that universe, humanity lives under an oppressive and pretty evil by today's standards, Imperium of Man. This Imperium of Man was founded by a genocidal maniac in gold power armor. In Warhammer Fantasy, you got a heroic fantasy universe. It's filled with vile villains, but mighty heroes. The world can and does get dark, but it never gets dark for the sake of dark, and all the darkness gets fully fleshed out and justified in the stories, and no one is just evil. In fantasy, you have the noble but kind of corrupt empire of man, and since we have a fantasy universe, we are at a much lower state of technology than in 40k. The tech the empire has is roughly 1600s with some 1800s thrown in. There are bad guys in the Empire of Man, but they're usually the exception rather than the rule, and they usually get some sort of comeuppance at the end of the novel. The Empire was founded by a Bronze Age tribesman named Sigmar Unbrogen, a guy who wanted to unite the warring tribes of humanity to give them a fighting chance against the giant green rage monsters and Cthulhu demons. He is never genocidal, well, except for that one time he was being mind controlled by an evil necromancer, 
he even shows mercy to his enemies and even cultivates a millennia long treaty with the dwarfs. And in the current year of Warhammer Fantasy, 2500 years post Sigmar, humanity still works with the dwarfs and even works with the elves. And the elves help humanity establish a magical school. Contrast that to 40k, where the MP of Mankind is a genocidal tyrant that destroys anyone who opposes him. In the Imperium of Man, you have to worship the Emperor, otherwise you get blamed for heresy. In the Empire of Man, there are many gods, and they are freely worshipped. When you read fantasy, you get cool dudes fighting all the bad guys, and usually winning. Or put simply, the Imperium of Man looked into the abyss, and they blinked. Whereas the Empire did not. With all that in mind, let's get to the bloody books. Back in 2010, I was not a fan of fantasy. I called it ignorant sci-fi. I had seen Warhammer Fantasy advertised in 40k books, but I paid it no mind. Blech, a dwarf never forgets? A dwarf never forgives? Pfft, what tripe. Or so I thought. Then a fan commented that I should read the Gotrek and Felix series. I thought, you know, why the hell not? Not expecting much, I bought the first Omnibus, and 40 books later, Warhammer Fantasy is my second favorite book series, second only to Star Wars itself. Like with Warhammer 40k, novels are published singly and then in Omnibus form, and today I will primarily be recommending Omnibuses, but also a few singles here and there. Most of these Omnibuses were republished in 2019 as part of the Warhammer Chronicles line, but you might have to, shall we say, get creative if you want to read these bloody things, and use bookstores, among other places, may indeed be your friend. So, if you are an ignorant peasant who has never heard of Warhammer Fantasy, here are a few gateway books that will take you from an unwashed troglodyte to a wealthy Reeksland graph. Oh yeah, unlike with most fantasy series, Warhammer Fantasy is based kind of on the Germans, with a lot of German terminology, along with some British sensibilities. It's a kick-ass goulash of fun. So your first novel should be Go Trek and Felix Omnibus 1, Drakenfels, Brunner, The Bounty Hunter, and a Legend of Sigmar. Go Trek and Felix Omnibus 1 was written by William King, and this omnibus collects Troll Slayer, Scoven Slayer, and finally, Demon Slayer. This omnibus was published in 2006 and republished in the year 2019. This is basically the best first fantasy novel collection ever. Each Gotrek and Felix novel will be named after something Gotrek kills, and this carries on to this day, as Gotrek Gernerson is basically the most popular character in all of Warhammer Fantasy. Gotrek Gernerson is a dwarf slayer. He committed some sin, and thus to atone, he must die in battle. He is an engineer, and thus does machines. Oh dear. And he wields a magical battle axe. That changes style depending on the book. Sometimes it's a normal axe, and sometimes it's a double-headed axe. It really just depends on the writer and the artist drawing it on the cover. Gotrek's little buddy is a nerd named Felix Jaeger. He is from the Empire of Man, and one day he was pulling a Texas and was protesting the latest tax levied upon the people by the government. The Fed sent out troops to put down the riot, and Gotrek and Felix fought side by side and escaped into the wilderness. They swear a Chewbacca-style life debt to one another, and Felix will follow Gotrek around and once Gotrek finds his mighty doom, Felix will create an epic poem about him. Yep, Felix is a bloody nerd. He likes three things. Writing, drinking, and getting under the skirts of a comely lass. A lass that he impressed with epic poetry skills, and yes, this happens all throughout the series. He can gut bastards with the best of them, and has a magical sword. And even though he's in the pasty, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cyphus Kane from 40k. Gotrek and Felix are the two greatest heroes of that universe, and kick ass and take names, and save a whole bunch of people throughout the series. Troll Slayer is one of the best fantasy books to start off with. It's an anthology of short stories, and these stories will slowly introduce you to the universe while also giving you great character moments and lore. If you've never read a fantasy book before, Troll Slayer is a lot like the starting area in an RPG. Pretty low level stuff to get you acclimated. Book 2, Scoven Slayer, is the sewer level. Gotrek and Felix have no money, and they gotta work as sewer jacks, aka they hunt down monsters in the sewer. They fight the evil Skaven, foul rat-like humanoids that were made famous by the game Vermintide. The novel introduces a villain that will become a series regular, Grey Seer Thanqual, a hilariously dangerous Skaven mage. 
like this book well enough, but it lags in a few places, but it's more than made up by my favorite fantasy novel of all time, Demon Slayer. I reviewed this book way back in 2012, and after all this time, it's still my favorite fantasy novel of all time. So, in the Warhammer world, at each pole, there are terrors in reality that led in the legions of Space Cthulhu's, aka the Forces of Chaos. And you see, the Forces of Chaos are led by four Chaos Gods, Nurgle, Slanesh, Korn, and Zeech. Standing against them are the forces of order, the humans, the dwarfs, and the elves, and they've been fighting against chaos for thousands of years. In this novel, Gotrek and Felix hitch a ride on a dwarven-made, oil-fired airship that is magically protected by a kick-ass mage named Max Shriver, and they literally head into what is effectively hell to get a magical warhammer to reunite the dwarven people. If that premise does not make you run out to buy that book, I don't know what will because that plot is every bit as awesome as it sounds and i'm gonna spoil something here but i don't know where else i would say this at the end of the novel we get a moment that i wonder if the guys behind the marvel movies kind of ripped off you see uh felix jaeger has his own captain america and mjolnir moment oh yes and it's just as awesome as that sounds. Not only did this omnibus get me into fantasy, but it also got my grandfather into Warhammer fantasy as well. And he would always joke about having to find my doom. As you might imagine, Gotrek and Felix got super bloody popular, and as of this video, there are 17 bloody books, and we will cover some of them in a bit. Okay, so you read some Go Trek and Felix and are hyped for some more fantasy. Well, it's time to crack open the first Warhammer book of all time. Drakenfels was written by Kim Stanley Newman and published 35 years ago in 1989, the very year your humble knight General Lotz was born. This is one of the best Warhammer novels ever, tied with Demon Slayer itself. It concerns itself with the creation of a play by a guy named Dietlif Serik. In short, there was a vile villain named Drakenfels, and he was defeated by a valiant prince, and since the prince wants to increase his fame, he commissions playwright Detlef Serik to memorialize his epic deeds. The novel mocks some fantasy tropes, plays some straight, has some horror and some humor, and Mr. Newman turns in a real bloody page turner. While my grandfather wouldn't be a particularly big fan of this novel, this got my grandmother to read some Warhammer fantasy. So you read that and love fantasy even more, well now it's time to read Fantasy Boba Fett! Brunner the Bounty Hunter was written by C.L. Warner, and this omnibus was published in 2010. Mr. Warner is from Texas, and has penned some of the very best Warhammer fantasy books ever. And this is a good place to start. See this cover? Yeah. Boba Bloody Fett, and not that drunk Uncle Fett from Disney Wars. This is the true Stone Cold Killer Fett from the true EU. Brunner is a bounty hunter, and he hunts down vile villains. And he does this throughout a few short stories, novellas, and finally a full-fledged book. These stories started life in the White Dwarf magazine that G-Dubs put out to all the tabletop nerds. This means that when you go through the short stories, it can be a bit of a slog, since each story will repeat who Brunner is, is ad nauseum because the short stories had to fill in gaps for potential first-time readers. Despite this, the stories themselves are good fun. They are a lot darker than the previous books I mentioned, but Brunner is never the bad guy, even though the writer himself says that in another work, Brunner would be the villain. Don't really see that, since in most stories, while not a nice guy, he never harms the innocent. In fact, in one of the earliest stories, he takes like a 50 cent payment to kill an evil bastard that was oppressing a tiny village. Funny enough, in a Star Wars omnibus, Boba Fett himself had that very same adventure. And in the original A-Team TV show, there was a story like that too, but whatever. Brunner ends up fighting some demons, some dragons, all that good stuff. Now, if you loved those books, this last one will take the proverbial cake. The Legend of Sigmar was written by Graham McNeil of 40k fame. This omnibus was published in 2012 and is part of the prequel series Time of Legends. And this chronicles the rise of Sigmar Unbrogan. You know, the fantasy equivalent of the God Emperor of Mankind from 40k? Yeah, Sigmar is a good guy from his teen years unto his dotage. 
yeah, he has a temper, but he never lets him control him. The series shows him building the Empire of Man and how hard it is to found it and later maintain it. The name Warhammer comes from two different sources according to 1D6 Shan. It either comes from the name of some guy in a source book or it comes from the fact that Sigmar carries a magical Warhammer, which is named in universe Galmaraz, aka Skull Splitter, that he gives from the dwarves after he saves their king from orcs. And you better believe he splits a whole bunch of skulls. In fact, there is one scene where he leaps off the back of a horse, and yes, you can hear that Led Zepp, and brings the hammer down on the head of a 12 foot tall goat monster. Oh, this omnibus is so badass. It's got the pacing down just right, and you are never waiting for something to happen. It's got enough lore to keep you going, and Sigmar does grow a lot from book one to book three, and this should floor even the most jaded of reader. Speaking of such, Gramps loved this book, even though he called it too talky and likened Sigmar to King Arthur. Still pretty high praise, nonetheless. And I hope you got enough gamer fuel, cause there's no stopping now. We got even more recommendations coming. Go Trickin' Felix has got a shit ton of novels, most of which are pretty good, and I have them all, but I recommend getting Omnibus 2 and 3, and then making sure you still want to keep going. Omnibus 2 features the novels Dragon Slayer, so good, Beast Slayer, Eh, and Vampire Slayer, hell yeah! Dragon Slayer is almost as good as Demon Slayer. A big ass dragon attacks the dwarf airship on the way back from hell, and Gotrek and Felix and the airship's inventor, Malkali Mackinson, aka Fantasy Scotty from Star Trek, have to track down the dragon and show him the error of his ways. Beast Slayer is merely okay compared to Demon Slayer and Dragon Slayer. In this novel, Gotrek and Felix have to fight a much more mundane enemy. Essentially, they gotta stop a warlord from taking over the city of Prague. And yet, Yes, there is a prog in fantasy. I'll give you two guesses where William King is from. Vampire Slayer is a much more enjoyable novel because they're actually fighting against a villain that is worthy of their might. This has Gotrek and Felix tracking down a vampire named Adolphus Krieger. Mr. Krieger is not a smart vampire. I mean, you'd think he would be considering he's hundreds of years old. He gets it into his pasty little head that it's a good idea to kidnap Felix's girlfriend. Well, no one steals his chicks and lives. Felix's girlfriend is a sexy babe named Ulrika Magdova, and after this novel, she will get her own spin-off. At the end of the novel, Gotrek and Felix use a portal to go to Fantasy Britain. Omnibus 3 features Giant Slayer, the last William King novel, Orc Slayer, and Manslayer. The last William King pinned Gotrek and Felix novel is really bloody good. Gotrek and Felix have to stop some recurring villains from destroying the entire bloody world. The other two were written by Nathan Long and are set 20 years after Giant Slayer. And we really missed out on some cool adventures as Gotrek and Felix are said to have fought through fantasy Middle East. But alas, these two novels are merely okay, but nothing special, and are sadly pretty forgettable. If you like those two omnibuses and maybe gave yourself a break between Gotrek and Felix's, I recommend picking up Elf Slayer, Shaman Slayer, and Zombie Slayer. These novels are pretty good. Now, I got these originally in singles, but I do believe they are now part of an omnibus, and these novels are much better than Nathan Long's previous novels and are much more memorable. Elf Slayer has the duo get kidnapped by Dark Elves, a bunch of sadistic murderers, and they have to escape a Black Ark, a giant Dark Elf slave ship. Shaman Slayer has the pair take down an evil shaman that turns people into monsters. Zombie Slayer is a direct sequel and has them take on the zombified corpse of the monsters that they just finished slaying. Felix starts going nuts and asks why fight it all? And Gotrek just says, cause then we'd lose. And then they get to chopping. The novels after these are all pretty generic. They're all pretty much side quills and her quills and are just kind of meandering. They're not terrible, but you can definitely skip them. The series ends when the universe ends and it's a pretty bad ending to say the least. Sadly, Felix is killed when the universe explodes Gotrek actually survives the end of the Warhammer Fantasy setting and is spat out into Age of Sigmar. Now for those who are wondering what Age of Sigmar even is, it's basically Warhammer Fantasy but with really, really stupid names. Gotrek is utterly ruined in Age of Sigmar, where once he was this awesome warrior, now he is basically just a grumpy old man. 
And that's pretty sad because in one of the audio dramas, he's voiced by Brian Blessed. Go Treks Alive! Sadly, his character isn't, and he's pretty boring and generic. And sadly, the talents of Brian Blessed are wasted on the shit to writing that's seen in Age of Sigmar. So remember Felix's girlfriend? Well, she becomes a vampire and gets her very own trilogy. That is collected in the Ulrika the Vampire Omnibus by Nathan Long, the same guy who did those five Go Trek and Felix books. He does good work showing Ulrika learning to control the raging beast inside her. Ulrika is basically insane the entire trilogy, and Mr. Long shows her slowly gain some simulants of sanity as the stories progress. The books get dark, and Ulrika even goes evil for a bit. Good stuff all around. Next, we got Mattias Thoman the Witch Hunter by our good buddy C.L. Warner. This chronicles the adventures of witch hunter Mattias Thulman. So, in Warhammer Fantasy, those portals to hell can mutate people and those mutants turn evil. Also, necromancers and witches are on the prowl for human flesh. And the one organization to stem the tide are the witch hunters. They are a lot like the Inquisition from Warhammer 40k, but far less evil. Mattias starts up the series as an asshole with a heart of gold. He treats people like crap, but never goes too far, and when an innkeeper is like, dude, food costs money, man, Maddie's is like, oh, sorry, my man. Okay, maybe he doesn't put it like that, but still, he does give the innkeeper some money to buy better food. Mattias is described to look like classic horror actor Vincent Price and wears an awesome uniform with a kick-ass hat. He wields a sword blessed by the fantasy pope and a brace of flintlocks. Cause hell yeah, Warhammer has guns. Each novel in the omnibus has a thread running through them where Mattias is trying to find an evil doctor, but the plots in the novels generally have him taking down some kind of creepy crawly. The scariest bit in the novel novel is where a corrupt governor gets slowly turned into a toad monster. Mattias is pretty much my third favorite character in the entire franchise. Sadly, we didn't get any more books with him, a missed opportunity to say the least. Next we got Knights of Bretonia, written by Anthony Reynolds. This omnibus chronicles the adventures of Bretonian knight named Callard. The Empire of Man is not the only human nation in the Warhammer world. You got Japan, Italy, China, and finally we got France, aka Bretonia. They are a brutal nation where the peasants are oppressed and the knights are callous and uncaring. But that's what makes this omnibus so fun! Coward is not a villain, he kills the shit out of evil slaughtering orcs and vampires, but he treats peasants like shit and is an arrogant dick to boot. To us, he is at best an anti-hero, but to the Bretonians, he is a pure hero classic. And that's what makes this series so great. Different cultures will have different definitions of hero, and some of those definitions are decidedly villainous. But what Reynolds does is he gives us a Bretonian hero that fits within his society, but is not so bad that he will turn the audience against him. Meaning that while he mocks peasants for being poor, he won't just randomly kill one for fun, or worse, and still has a tiny bit of nobility. Different media works try to be subversive with their protagonists and usually they don't work because the protagonists are just plain bad and they'll try to like say oh, you don't have to agree with them to root for them or some such postmodernist twaddle but Anthony Reynolds here legitimately succeeds in giving us that kind of subversive protagonist you can still root for coward because he really needs to kill the shit out of those orcs but you don't have to agree with his elitist and authoritarian beliefs Man, Warhammer is bloody good. The stories themselves are still great fun, with great lore, action, and thanks to Coward being a douche, we got great satire too. Don't let Coward's shittiness as a person turn you off from these books, because they are some of the most unique in all of Warhammer fantasy. Yar, me mateys, it is time to head to the high seas. We got a single here called Dreadfleet by Phil Kelly. This tied in with a naval board game of the same name. This novel stars a pirate captain named Roth. After his family is killed by vampire Admiral Noctilus, Roth embarks on an epic journey to take him down. We got ninjas, we got a ship with a steampunk robot that wields a magical warhammer, thank Pirates of the Caribbean, just without Amber Heard tormenting Captain Jack. This was another book that Gramps was quite fond of, even if he was never a big fan of water. I could talk about Warhammer Fantasy all bloody day, but we gotta stop it somewhere. And so the last book we're gonna talk about today is set during the time of Legends. What we have here is Skaven Wars, The Black Plague. 
Or is it the plaque? I can never remember. And this omnibus is written by, you know him, you love him, it's C.L. Warner. This novel is set 1,000 years after Sigmar created the Empire of Man and finds the Empire of Man beset by the tyranny of Emperor Boris Goldgatherer, a statist that uses heavy taxation to enrich himself. Hmm, where have I heard that before? To make matters worse, the foul skaven are on the march. They have created the bubonic plague and have used specially bred fleas to infect the Empire of Man. This is another great epic fantasy trilogy, proper pacing, great characters, and a kick-ass ending. This trilogy has the grossest and most horrific thing that I've ever read in Warhammer. So you remember those demon killer from 40k? Yeah, those are bad, but in book two of the Omnibus, Boris Goldgather has a warlock try to create a cure for the bubonic plague, and this warlock tortures an innocent teenage girl and while the novel does not show this it talks about it after the fact and the writing is so good that it gave me chills the torture of this 16 year old girl is part of a magical ritual that turns the poor girl into a blood leech she produces magical leeches that the debased court of boris eat to stave off the plague thankfully he and his court get theirs because warhammer might be dark but those who choose it fall by the light of sigmar all right, everyone is free to go and buy some of the best books ever. This is General Otz wishing you good Legend of Sigmar and good Mattias Thulman or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and please consider leaving a like or a comment as the algorithm desires your soul. And I want to thank all those fans who have supported this channel, both past and present.